All right, it's your friendly favorite neighborhood apologist, Damon Richardson, for another edition of Urban Logia Live. Tonight, tonight, I am going to be talking about the effects of false doctrine and cultism on the mind, the effects of false doctrine and cultism on the mind. So uh, let's start it off tonight, uh, just finding out who's in the house, who's here, as always, uh, shout out your city, rep your city, let us know where you're watching from, and uh, welcome again to another edition of Urban Logia Live. Uh, we're so glad that you decided to join us for this important conversation. Uh, I pray that it will enlighten you, that it will inform you, uh, that it will equip you, uh, and that it will encourage you uh, with the truth. And, uh, and so um, we're going to be having a really important conversation uh, I'll talk for a little while, kind of laying the argument out. And as always, uh, we'll turn to the comment section for uh, questions uh, and even pushback. And uh, and so uh, let's uh, let's see who's in. Uh, I see Teresa uh, and uh, Will. Uh, Floyd, I see you. OK, Marie. All right. All right. All right. Shoddy Mills. Derek, blessings to you. All right. And uh, Grace Alone, Van Harris, Dothan, Alabama. Oh, man, love you too, bro. Appreciate you. All right. And there's Nadine in New York City. All right. NYC in the house. Alexis, I see you. T. Johnson, blessings to you. All right, all right. Try him and see. From Virginia, blessings to you. Larry Wilson. My bro, Willie James, all right, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, keep hitting that like and share button. And uh, Rel, oh, wonderful. Thank you for this uh, blessed super chat. We really appreciate it. And uh, we wanna encourage as many of you to, uh, if you haven't become a member, do so tonight. Uh, let tonight be your night to uh, become a member of Urban Logia. And uh, also make sure that you subscribe to our channel. Help us to hit that 10,000 mark. Uh, we really need your help. Derek in Seattle. I see you, dear brother. Truly blessed. All right. Greensboro. And uh, my bro, George Saylor. Buffalo in the house. Buffalo, New York. Upstate. Harrisburg, PA. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. So we're going to jump into it. Uh, we are, we're definitely going to get uh, uh, get right into the discussion tonight, and I think this is going to be really uh, helpful to a lot of people. It's going to really answer some questions, clear some things up, uh, and most importantly, uh, oh, there we go, Marie. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you uh, so much, dear sister. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your support. Uh, I believe this is my brother. I believe this is my brother, the Bishop Lynchburg, VA. I see you, bro. All right, all right. Buffalo via Clearwater. I see you, I see you. All right. Yes, indeed. Teresa, thank you so kindly, dear sister. We really appreciate it. And uh, let's go. We had about 46. Let's get on with it. Uh, I'm going to do a little teaching at first to, to in order to establish uh, where the conversation is going, and uh, we'll we'll get right into uh, tonight's discussion. Rochester in the house. I see New York all over the place. All right, so we're going to be talking about the effects of false doctrine and cultism on the mind. Right. So one of the things that uh, I think often gets under overlooked um, and uh, not necessarily, um, I should say it doesn't get the attention that it needs to get, especially when people um, become members at uh, a different church or what have you. Uh, there are many people who are exiting different kinds of situations, whether it is a, a bad church experience uh, whether it is a church that taught false doctrine in some kind of way uh, or a church that was cultish, uh, not only theologically, but cultish also sociologically. What often ends up happening 
to many of those people is that they just get lost by the wayside. Many of them never return to a church. Uh, many fall into depression. Uh, you have some that commit suicide. You have some who essentially become atheist or agnostic because they find it easier to reconcile their experiences to their not being a God or nothing really being true or certain than to continue to believe that way and not know how to um, understand their experience, right? So, so there's all kinds of issues with that. People are typically not exiting these situations in healthy ways. What's more is that many of these people do end up in churches and they're still not getting the attention they need. And what I mean by the attention is, is that um, the effects, the psychological effects of false teaching over time on the mind and cults uh, has long-term psychological consequences. That's not like dust that you can just sweep up under the rug and yeah, I'll get it another time lift the end of the rug up, just sweep it up under there and forget about it. You, you can't do that with um, the the effects on the mind are not only long lasting uh, in terms of consequence and impact, but it gets worse and worse. It doesn't get better. It doesn't go away. You can't forget about it. You can't bury it. And and that's it. No, 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 no. It 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 has a deteriorating kind of effect. So let me let me just put it out as plain as I can. When when you hear many of us on here railing against false doctrine, it's not just because of the eternal and the spiritual consequences that it has. Make no mistake about it, false teaching does something to your mind. It rewires the way your mind works. And, and a lot of people don't, they don't understand that. There are severe consequences uh, that false doctrine has on the mind over a period of time. In fact, it doesn't even take long for the effect of false teaching and cultism, cult, cultism to even set in. But the longer it has that effect, the more devastating. Let me anchor what I'm saying so that you don't think, okay, this is just some pop psychology kind of discussion. You know, Richardson's acting like some motivational speaker, you know, waxing eloquent in, you know, pop psychology and this, that, or the other. No, no, no. Let me anchor what, what I am about to say in scripture. Let me anchor it in scripture so that you can see that when I'm talking about the effects of false doctrine and cultism on the mind, that it is rooted already in what the Bible has to say about the effects of sin on the mind. So theologians uh, call that the noetic effect, N-O-E-T-I-C. If you want to write that down, there's a good 75 cent word. Find a way to use it in a sentence. The noetic effect of sin. It is from the Greek word nous, N-O-U-S, N-O-U-S, nous, which is the Greek word for mind. Well, when uh, the fall occurred, sin impacted every aspect of our humanity, including our capacity to think. And oftentimes we take that for granted because you see a whole lot of smart people in the world and you're like, well, certainly they're unregenerated, but they're so smart. You see all these atheists and, you know, your Richard Dawkins is and, you know, all these type people. And you're like, wow, why are they so smart? They don't even believe in God. Well, it doesn't mean that sin has uh, incapacitated the ability of the mind to work. That's not what noetic effect of sin means. It means that it has darkened the mind and it has left the mind in such an impaired state that the mind is unable without the aid of God 
to work as God has intended. And so the mind being darkened and left to its own uh, and, and left to itself uh, essentially um, wanders into uh, essentially futility, right? And unless the mind becomes captured by the word of God, literally captured by the word of God and brought under uh, the influence of God's word, the mind will ultimately uh, become subject to futility. Uh, this is what the Koaleth or the uh, ecclesiastical writer mentioned when he talked about in the King James, it says vanity and vexation of spirit, which is a really old archaic way of saying futility, right? In fact, uh, more modern translations put it even plainer than that. It refers to chasing the wind, right? How futile is that? Trying to chase the wind and capture it is, is, is certainly an exercise in vanity. Well, that's essentially the that's essentially the end result of the mind unaided by God is that it it, it just becomes um, a uh, it, it literally just becomes a uh, a captive of futility. It it's darkened and it is unable, without the aid of God to function in the ways that God has intended so as to bring glory to God. God intends for us to bring glory to him through our thinking. Um, it's interesting because in Jewish thought, studying is one of the highest, is considered one of the highest forms of worship. We have become so anti-intellectual in the church that we have uh, thought about all kinds of weird things like uh, dichotomies between faith and reason. We've created unnecessary tension. And we've even suggested in certain church contexts that a person thinking is not being spiritual. A person uh, using their intellect to study the word of God uh, is not being led by the spirit. That's not only anti-intellectual, that's demonic. That's demonic, right? God intends for you to use your mind to his glory, right? So uh, in the Shema, it's to hear, Shema, hear, that is to listen with the intention to receive and to obey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one and you shall worship the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, right? Jesus even quoted this. And, uh, and so uh, we ought to worship the Lord with our mind, with our thinking. And so the mind plays a very significant role uh, in not only our humanity, uh, but in our worship, right? So studying the word of God and not just studying the word of God, but how we use our minds to uh, essentially, uh, what's the word, appropriate truths, all truth is God's truth and how we use our minds to appropriate truth that ultimately brings glory to God in whatever whatever station in life we're in, whatever our, our calling is or wherever our gifts are, God intends for us to use our mind. Now, sin has created a darkening effect on the mind. Let me go to scripture so that you could understand that this is the foundation for where this is going. Stay with me because this is really important. And so the first thing I want to show, uh, let me go here. Uh, let's go to uh, Romans 1. Let's go to Romans 1, 21. I'm going to try to run through these quickly so that you get the foundation for it. And then we're going to get into the specifics of it all. So Romans 1, 21, this is Paul talking about general revelation. Uh, that God has given through creation that brings insight to the basics of his existence and his divinity, right? How it is revealed in creation. And then he talks about the effect of sin and the apostatizing effect that sin has had on humanity, whereby they turn the creature into the creator and worship things like animals and trees and all kinds of things, right? But in verse uh, 21, 
he says, for though, this is the CSB, for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless. This is the impact of sin on the mind, the noetic effect. Their thinking became worthless, watch this, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming then to be wise, they became fools. And as a result, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling more than mortal man. So notice the things that they did in terms of idolatrous worship and homosexuality and all of those things were the result of the mind becoming darkened and becoming worthless and futile. Right, these things were the byproduct of that. So, so one of the ver one of the very first places that sin laid claim to in the fall was on the thinking of people. Let's go over to uh, let's look at Second uh, Corinthians chapter three. So, go with me real quick. Second Corinthians chapter three. If somebody can write these down. In the don't ask any questions right now because I'm not going to see any of the questions at this point. Uh, I'll get to that later. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's look at verse 14. So, the first one is Romans 1 21. If somebody can write that down in the chat, and the second is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. Here's what it says it says, well, let's look at verse 12. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Speaking of the Israelites, notice their minds were hardened. For to this day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains. So it's talking about the hardening of the mind that creates a blindness, a veil, as it were, over the ability of the mind to accept truth, right? Not, not necessarily uh, the inability to understand it, but the inability and unwillingness to accept truth a veil, a blindness, as it were. Uh, look at chapter four, same, same letter, 2 Corinthians chapter four. Let's look at verse four. Verse four says this. It says, uh, well, we'll start at verse three. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So remember, Paul saying hey, the gospel is, 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 is open news, it's public, it's not veiled, right? Even when people have a veil over their minds, the gospel is not veiled. Um, if it is veiled, it's veiled to people who are perishing, people who are unregenerated, who are lost. In their case, this is the case of those who have had their minds captured, um, the God of this age, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see? So, so you'll notice then that uh, the Satan and demons work really hard on keeping people blind, but they work through the mind in order to be able to do that. Right, so so that's what Paul had to say. Uh, let's also look at Ephesians chapter four. Uh, two more verses. I just want to establish where we're going in the conversation, giving it a biblical basis, so that you understand that, um, you know, yeah, we're talking about some spiritual dynamics, but we're also talking about a very real psychological dynamic, a very real psychological dynamic. Um, Cults and false teaching are contributors to poor mental health, just like there are other things that 
uh, correlate and contribute to um, poor mental health. It is a fact that false teaching and, and the effects of cults on, on, on the mind contributes to mental health. Look at Ephesians 4 and verse, uh, what is it? Verse 18. Well, let's look at 14. Let's look at verse 14. Then we will no longer be children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking truth in love, verse 15, let us grow in every way in him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. Verse 17, therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do, notice, in the futility of their thoughts, the vanity, the futility, the worthlessness of their thoughts. Why? They are darkened in their understanding. Verse 18, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. This, this is evidence biblically of how sin actually affects the way that the mind works. So let's talk about uh, some of what some of those effects actually are in terms of uh, what false doctrine actually does. What does it actually do uh, to a person? Well, uh, right away, right here in Ephesians chapter four, verse 14, one of the things that Paul talks about is that uh, the effect of false teaching on the mind uh, causes uh, believers to lose stability. And this is what he says, don't be like children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine because children are still forming in their ability to reason and their ability to make judgment. You want to know why, uh, uh, for instance, in our society, under a certain age, we don't sell alcohol uh, to children? You want to know the number one reason why? Because children are still developing in their mental capacity, right? And in such a critical and crucial developmental stage, the last thing they need is to have their judgment suspended, their reasoning impaired by intoxication. They already lack the ability to have sound judgment. They already lack that. So, so children can be talked off to the side easily, but that's how so many children get kidnapped and all kinds of things. It is because children are still developing in their ability uh, to uh, have discernment. Uh, make sound decisions and judgment. Uh, that's why we guide them. That's why we teach them and we inform them. They don't have that ability. So they're, they're wishy-washy, if you will. They, they lack stability, right? And, and, and so one of the, one of the um, characteristics of spiritual maturity is stability, right? When you're constantly being carried off by this kind of, uh, you're, all, you're always talking about naming it and claiming it. And then when you've gone from that, it's decreeing and declaring. And then it's from there shifting the atmosphere. All you are proving is that you are spiritually immature. You are a child in your, in your, uh, uh, your spiritual life and in your thinking. You, you, you lack discernment the ability to stabilize yourself in the word of God, to be anchored in your thinking. So you're always off with this teacher and that teacher and this false doctrine and that false doctrine. You lose stability. But watch this. When you start losing stability doctrinally, it does not stop there. 
because it has an effect on the way that you process information, you also start losing stability in other areas of your life. So that is one of the effects of false doctrine and even the cults uh, on the mind. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to show you something real quick. 2 Peter chapter 3, and let's look at verse uh, 15. We'll read 15 to 17. Now, Peter here is talking about false teachers. That's the context. And so um, listen to what he says. Uh, was that 2 Peter 3? Yeah. He says, also regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all of his letters. This is Peter acknowledging knowledge of the letters of Paul. He even says, there are some things hard to understand in them. So he acknowledges that at times Paul can be difficult to understand but not completely impossible to understand, Paul, at times difficult. Notice he said some things, not all things, not most things, but some. But the untaught, watch this, watch this word, and unstable. You know how I always go back to who taught you? The untaught and the unstable, that the, this is, Peter literally, uh, recognizes these kind of categories existing among people who consider themselves to be Christian. He said that they're untaught and they're unstable. And as a result, notice, untaught refers to the lack of proper and right information in the mind. They are untaught and they are unstable, which goes back to what we just explained in. Uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. As a result of that, what happens to them? They will twist them to their own destruction. Twist what? Scripture. The, the effects of false teaching causes people to twist scriptures to their own destruction. Notice, as they also do with the rest of scripture. So notice how Peter equates Paul's letters with the rest of scriptures. He said that's what they do with Paul's writings, uh, because they're untaught and because they're unstable, they twist them to their own destruction, just like they do the rest of scripture. So, so uh, listen, put it in part. I promise you, don't even idle in this, this teaching tonight. Put it in part, turn the engine off and listen to what I am about to say. False teaching creates such a devastating impact on your mind that you lose the ability to properly exegete the whole of scripture. Like it's not just one little piece. It starts spreading like a cancer, like gangrene, until you lose the ability to holistically tie together the meaning of scripture and hear scripture uh, for what it is intended to communicate. Notice, they twist it to their own destruction as they do the rest of scripture. So it's not just the Pauline corpus or writings that they have a problem with. They've got a problem with all of it because their mind is so perverted. I'm gonna keep going. So let's let's talk some more. What happens? When you embrace false doctrine, you, you think, oh, well, you know, if it, if it, you know, all I want to know is enough to get into heaven. Okay. You have ingested so much false doctrine that you don't even realize that false doctrine has incapacitated your ability to soundly reason. You ever talk with somebody that's just so chock full of false doctrine? that they just don't even have the ability to make logical sense anymore? I know you do. You talk to them every day on the internet. You know what's wrong with them? Uh, sin and false doctrine 
has perverted their mind. Like they, they have lost a strong ability to even be rational, to even be logical. You ever listen to somebody? Sometimes you, 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 you're in one of these groups and you're listening to some of these so-called woke people and they're just so daggone incoherent. You're like, what? What? I mean, they just, they all sound like Oswald Bates for some reason. And you see, the um, um, uh, medulla oblongata causes a gastration effect on the, uh, uh, you know, and then they just just rambling on with all kinds of words that are not even fitting the context, so forth and so on. The reality is, is that many people lose the ability to even reason soundly and be logical because this is what false doctrine actually does. It dismantles the way that you think. Why though? Why preacher? It is because when you are learning false doctrine, one of the things that false teachers do is they put safeguards around the false doctrine, preventing you from questioning it. Let me show you something. This is what Whitsett said uh, in a peer-reviewed article on the psychological effect of cults on the mind. He said the brain is integrated vertically from top to bottom and vice versa. How well this integration happens decides how well we can process thoughts, reasonings, judgments, emotions, perceptions, etc. Without properly exercising this vertical connection, people are cut off from their feelings or they are unable to think clearly and make rational decisions, thus making them both highly suggestible and emotionally vulnerable. So keep in mind that the brain is, dis is divided into two halves. The right half mostly controls our emotions and the left half controls uh, our ability to process and reason and rationalize. That's where language development takes place. And there's a vertical connection between the two. False teaching and cults, what they do is they circumvent that and they control it by not allowing you the freedom to, to question and, 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 and they don't even allow you to even feel, uh, to, 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 even, to even have this proper sense of feeling. You ever heard something, you was like, man, that just doesn't sound right. And then you felt like there was something wrong with it. Well, cults and false teachers have you constantly questioning that. They, they have you questioning that. So that ultimately what ends up happening is you start developing guilt over the way that your brain is working. You start feeling bad that you're even questioning what you are hearing, that you're even sensing and feeling that there is something wrong with it. And over time, when you do that, you're not only suspending judgment in those moments, you're suspending your ability to make sound judgment when you hear things that are wrong. That's what ends up happening. That's why these folks go into depression. That's why they commit suicide. That's why they never want to step foot in another church. That, that's why they are confused. They hear truth and they're still looking like a deer caught in the head like, I'm confused. I, 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 I just don't understand what you're saying. And you're like, it's clear. It's right there. Look, the Bible says it. And they're still looking like, you know, uh, glazed over eyes and looking confused. You want to know something has happened in their mind. It is not functioning the way that it should function. What else happens with the effect of false teaching? Do you, you think you can play around with all this pseudo, uh, uh, pseudo spiritual warfare, uh, marine demons, and you think all that stuff is Christian? You go and mess around and be loony tunes, messing around in unsound doctrinal churches. That's why those kind of folks that when you talk to them, not only do they have loony doctrine, but they start sounding loony in life because 
it's it comes from the same place in the mind. You can't just be theologically loony and not end up being loony in school and loony on the job and loony in other parts of society. It starts to affect the way that you think. Thank you, Alexis. Welcome to the family. Thank you for joining. Uh, there's Teresa. Thank you for your super chat. We so kindly and greatly uh, appreciate it. Hold your questions. I am almost done, I promise you. What else are some of the lasting psychological consequences of false teaching on the mind? Well, not only does it impact your ability to reason soundly, but it impacts your judgment and decision making. See, in 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 churches that teach falsely and churches that are very cultish, one of the things that they uh, ultimately um culture culturize and condition you towards is essentially giving over that right to somebody else and they spiritualize it so you got a whole lot of folk that are handing over to somebody else the right to make basic decisions that they ought to make right so they're asking uh their bishop could they go on vacation and asking the bishop if they could uh, uh, Bishop, I, I'm about to buy a new car, Bishop Bishop. I'm about to buy a new car, Bishop. Uh, would you look at my new car first? I, I, I just, I just trust your spiritual leadership, Bishop, and and I just believe that I'll make the right decision about the car if you look at it and if you pray over the car first and all that other stuff. See, see what ends up happening is is that you end up losing the ability to even make sound judgment and proper decision-making in the way that God has designed your own mind to be able to do, it. right? So you thought you thought you could just leave a, a church that taught false doctrine, get in a good Bible-believing church, and, and, and that was going to be it? No, 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 no. We've got to address those effects because those effects are going to challenge your ability to receive the truth that's being taught at the new place. So, so this is why this is really important. Not only that, but it, it affects the mind in areas such as uh, anxiety and fear. Um, of course, cults are well known for what we call brainwashing or mind control. But what is mind control? What, 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 what does that really mean uh, when a person's mind is is essentially being controlled. So what ends up happening uh, is that one of the first things that people learn when they become part of churches that are not necessarily teaching sound doctrine or very cultish is they learn what the values are of that particular uh, group. Here, here are the values. Here's what we value. Here's what's important to us, right? And they also learn that it is not good to voice difference with any of these values. If you've got some, some thinking in your mind, you want to suffocate that, you want to sit on that, you don't want to voice that. Because if you voice that, you end you can end up in ostracization or even isolation, uh, even also shame and guilt and embarrassment. And so because people in that group have seen that happen to others, they learn to fear so that it does not happen to them. So they accept the teaching and the values without question in order to be able to avoid being ostracized, isolated, shamed, ridiculed, or even dealing with the guilt of thinking that somehow you are now on the wrong side of God because you have challenged some of what you have heard in this particular group. I'm going to tell you what happens when you suffocate that long enough. You end up being depressed. I mean, I mean clinically depressed. Because the mind is not designed to be put in neutral and park. It is designed to function and to work and to critically process information. It is not designed to be programmed like a computer. And, and you thought 
You are honoring the man of God by not ever questioning false teaching. You were not honoring the man of God. You were actually dishonoring God and you were setting your own self up for failure, not only spiritually, but emotionally and psychologically, as well as relationally. It is no wonder that your relationship with other people is also impaired. You don't even know how to rightly relate to other folks anymore. You, you think, ooh, ooh, when somebody has a disagreement. And, then, I, you know, I just don't, I just don't debate the word of God because that's what you learned where you were to never question anything. Then you get in healthy circles where people are reasoning together and talking it out. And you think there's something wrong with that. You don't even want to be a part of that. What else? What else does it do? Yeah. So, you know, again, I can go on and on and on with all kinds of ways that false doctrine affects the mind. You 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 start losing the sense of where the lines are. You know, uh, you, you cannot possibly accept this notion that you're going to be spiritual and you can believe things that are spiritual without having theological parameters around the spiritual. So once you buy into this whole thing, of, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say everything that there is to say about demons. Once you buy into that kind of thing, the Bible doesn't say everything that there is to say about this, that, or the other when it comes down to all matters of faith and practice. Once you can buy into the notion that um, whoever's teaching you or even your own mind uh, is equal as a final court of arbitration and final court of, uh, of, of authority on the matters of spirituality and faith and practice and all that. Once you can accept that your own personal experience, subjective experiences and group thinking and all of that, once you can accept that, that uh, um, you can go beyond the word of God to make decisions about what you are going to believe in these matters, you're setting yourself up for the okie doke. Listen, you want to know, let me, let me, let me do this because I got just a couple of minutes before I go to QA. But let me say this. You, you, um, there's some folk out here who know what they're doing. And whereas you might not see the danger in things, most of the time when the thing is dangerous, it's subtle. It's subtly dangerous, not overtly and obviously dangerous. We already have built-in mechanisms to recognize danger and instincts to run and do all kinds of things, right? Uh, when you are part of a church that regularly teaches false doctrine and part of a church that is cultic, uh, those kind of instincts, instincts get suspended. And then you don't even know when to run. What, what ends up happening, uh, what, I, I wanna write this down so I don't forget. What ends up happening is you start behaving in many ways like um, a victim of domestic uh, abuse, right? You, you talk to the young lady or even the guy in rare occasions uh, after some time of constantly being uh, abused. You talk to him and you say, hey, listen, you know, you, you, you really need to get out of that situation. It's not good. It, it's, having, it's taking a toll on you emotionally and mentally as well, as well as physically. It's dangerous. You got to get out of there. What ends up happening? Well, I believe it is in Proverbs 27. It says a full soul hates or loathes a honeycomb. But to the hungry, every bitter thing is sweet. Did you catch that? The, when you're full, you don't really want to see more food. Oh, no, Grandma. I, I just ate. I stopped at three houses on the way. Uh, eight Thanksgiving over there. I just came over to say happy Thanksgiving to you and see how you were doing. And she's insisting, oh no, you got to have some of my pie. Oh, you got to have some of my red velvet cake. And you're like, grandma, I can't, I'm so full. I, I can't eat anymore. I mean, you, you're so full. 
if you look at another slice of pie, you feel like you want to throw up. That's because you're full. But when a person is hungry, even something nasty is sweet to them. They will, it will be the, it will, it will be delicious to them. Something that a person that normally eats would say that's gross. I'd never eat that. A person that is deprived of food on a regular basis will look at that and it'll be sweet. It'll be delicious. It'll be good. Why? Because they are regularly deprived of what they should have. And so when a person is deprived of love and and, and right healthy affirmation, they learn to even see abuse as a form of love. And so the man might have knocked him upside the head one or two times. Then he goes out, buys a nice dress and some roses. And she's thinking, yeah, I know. I, I know Charlie ain't no good, but you know, he loves me and, 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 and he's going to grow out of it. He's going to change one day. And, and, and at least that little bit of attention is equated in her mind to love. So she puts up with it even more to the point that when she finally is able to get out of the relationship, she is so emotionally damaged that she doesn't even know what love even looks like unless somebody's cussing her out or, or raising the fist, threatening to punch. She, she doesn't even know what love even looks like. That's exactly what ends up happening to you when you stay in these kind of churches. You lose the ability to even be able to recognize what is false and, 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 and the ability to even question these kind of things because you take on this sense of group thinking. You ever notice that when you are at the movies versus when you are at home watching that same movie on your couch by yourself, that a certain scene that had the whole movie theater in stitches is not as funny as it is when you are sitting on the couch watching that movie alone. And why is that? Because of groupthink. We, we, we tend to go along with whatever the rest of the group is doing. There is this almost this sense of fear that if we act indifferent from the group, we will stand out. People will look at us, people will take notice of us, and they will ask, what's wrong with him? Let me go even further. I'm just peeling the onion. That's exactly what happens in these churches when folk go up for prayer. And then all of a sudden, two dudes start flanking you to the right and the left, and then some lady appears out of your peripheral with a sheet or a towel. And you're like, what are they doing? I just came up because I need a job. I need prayer. <laughs> what, what, what's going on? What, what are these jokers doing? What are they up to? And why does she have that sheet? They're already suggesting to you that when the, the preacher lays hands on you, you're supposed to fall out like everybody else did, just like the person uh, in front of you, just like this lady laying on the ground. And, 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 and just like all the other people. So it's already being suggested. So then what ends up happening? You end up psyching yourself out. You, you become hyper suggestible. That is, your mind becomes open to the degree that you are willing to believe anything. Yeah. So what do you do? You go along with it and you trick yourself into believing that you felt something indeed. So you fall out, why? Because why would you just stand there when everybody else is looking and they're like, what kind of demons, what kind of demons does he have that he's able to stand up under all that other, all that power and all these other people fell down and you don't want people thinking like that about you. So you conform to what the group is doing. It's called group behavior dynamics. You conform to what the group is doing so that you are not indifferent. I'm going to go, I'll go, let's peel that onion even more. You think it's spiritual. 
folk talking about let's have an encounter with worship encounter and all this other stuff. Listen, some of these people, whether knowingly or unknowingly, are borrowing uh, pages out of new age playbooks. Let me say that again. Some of these churches and their emphasis on worship experience and worship encounters are borrowing uh, are borrowing plays out of new age and occultic playbooks. This is one of the reasons why there's this constant repetition of certain verses. Ain't a whole lot of verses anyway, but they're constantly repeating certain words and that the song is going on for 30 whole minutes and the lights are low. All of these things, whether you know it or not, have an effect on your brain. It opens you up emotionally. Some of these, some of these false doctrine churches have praise and worship for an hour to two hours. It is no wonder that people are so willing to believe the nonsense that comes across the pulpit right after. They are, they have become emotionally uh, uh, manipulated and hyper suggestible to the point that they are willing to believe anything. Their, their reasoning and rationale has been lulled to sleep. Literally, they have become hypnotized. You think you haven't worship? You're not having worship. You're being hypnotized and becoming hyper suggestible in many of these situations. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. And 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 it, and it's no wonder that the churches that teach the worst doctrines put the most emphasis on praise and worship, encounter and experience. You want to know why? That's the easiest way to open you up and pull you in mentally and emotionally to whatever it is that they're trying to get across. Talk to me. Tell me I'm wrong. Somebody come on here and here's what we're going to do. Let's go to the, I'm going to go to the chat section and hear the rules. If you're going to ask a question, put question in front of your question. Make sure your question is relevant to the topic only. We're not talking about Adam and Eve. We're not talking about ev ontological evidence for God. We're not talking about creationism. We're talking about the effects of false doctrine and cultism on the mind. So put question in front of your question. And if you have a pushback, a reasonable pushback that is not trolling, but a, a sincere pushback in a, such a way that I disagree with this point that you made, um, put pushback in front of your pushback and, and I'll get around to it. All right. And um, let's go. So I am down at the bottom now. If you have a question, Go ahead and do that. I got my moderators. Uh, thank God for all of you working the chat. They're ready to go. Question in front of question, push back in front of push back. Let's talk about it. This is the dialogue part. Let's go. Anybody? Uh, let's see. All right. I am. Uh, let's see. Hang on. There we go. Okay, good. I was looking for it. How do we deal? And there's a little time delay here. So uh, if I don't see you, uh, I'll get around to you. But there is a little time delay uh, uh, here. So uh, how do we deal with former church members, family, friends of uh, oneness cult? Well, obviously be patient with them, especially if you have come out of uh, that as well. Be a little patient with them. Um, but, but at the same time, um, you know, not only pray for them, but walk them through, walk them through systematically, um, uh, the doctrine of salvation and the doctrine of God, because these are the two areas where they have, uh, where they have erred the most. Um, and sometimes you got to start off with building the right sense of value about scripture because they have been so used to taking as authority whatever their teachers are saying, less the word of God. Sometimes you got to start building the word of God out as a building this high view and high value for scripture out, 
right? So, so, uh, and, and more importantly, get them in a church, uh, and, and, uh, you know, either be part of that discipleship that they need part of that community of discipleship or whatever, but they've got, they've got some unpacking to do, uh, uh, or deconstructing. They've got to deconstruct some things first and then construct a new theological doctrinal foundation. So, yeah, so it, it, it's going to take a little bit of work. Another question, why do you feel these types of churches have such a draw in urban poor areas for this reason? Um, they are in other areas as well. Don't get me wrong. But um, cults are attracted to urban areas because poor people are desperate. And when people become desperate, they become, again, uh, hyper suggestible and they become greedy. They become greedy. Yeah. So so. Um, I remember reading an article about pyramid schemes. Uh, this was probably about 15 years ago. And uh, I was in Florida at the time. I think it was. I was I was in Florida. Um, yeah, I was in Florida at the time, I do believe. And um, there was an article in the Tampa Tribune about um, this major pyramid scheme bust in a church. And uh, there were a number of people contributing to the article, and they were talking about how this thing is common around the United States and that these Ponzi slash pyramid schemes uh, mostly start in churches. I was like, whoa, they mostly start in churches? And, um, and that one was one that they had busted in the church. And then there was a sociologist uh, commenting and the sociologist said this, and I remember thinking, I almost got offended when I when I read it, uh, but I thought about it, how true it was. The sociologist said one of the reasons that people are able to be manipulated financially uh, is because of their it's it's their own greed that gets taken advantage of. The manipulators know all of the buttons to push in terms of. What they want you to make decisions right now. This is a deal that's going away after tonight. And so they really want to suspend your judgment and all this other stuff. High pressure tactics, this, that, or the other. Well, cult leaders do the very same kind of thing, but they manipulate all kinds of things. You know, again, greed happens to be uh, one of them and uh, desperation and all kinds of things. And, uh, and so that's what makes um, urban areas uh, attractive areas for, um, cults and, and, you know, false teaching, so forth and so on. Great question. Excellent question. Um, how do you overcome the after effects from leaving such a doctrine, uh, and a church? Uh, that's where discipleship is important. Discipleship is a lifelong process, right? Uh, but I would also say this, not only is discipleship important, make no mistake about it. We can't spiritualize everything either. You know, if 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 um, I fall down, you know, after uh, playing some basketball or whatever, uh, and I uh, twist my ankle and swells up like a grapefruit and I, I go to the hospital, they do the MRI or whatever, this, that, and the other, like you broke your ankle. Um, I don't need prayer. I don't need, uh, you know, olive oil. And I don't need that. I, I need my ankle to be reset. And I need to be in a cast and I need to be off of it for some time. Right. Um, I, I can't apply. I can't apply, um, you know, teaching to a broken ankle. Right. So there, there's folk need counseling. Because there are some other aspects of our lives that get broken in the process. Our ability to reason, uh, emotional brokenness, these things get impaired and broken in that process. Counseling can help you with that. It's not all going to go away with discipleship. Discipleship will take care of the theological pieces right? The, the doctrinal piece, it'll take care of that. It's not going to take care of the emotional part. It's not going to take care of the, the noetic effects, the counseling, right? There are people who that's what they train for. They go to school to be able to help people heal 
in those areas. You, if you are in a church and uh, it's, you know, again, notorious for false doctrine or it is a cult of whatever sort, this, that, or the other, don't just exit. Exit with some help. You're going to need it because you are you are more damaged than you even realize. You can't do a self-diagnosis. You know, folk don't be doctoring on themselves. That's dangerous. I don't you I don't care if you you are I don't care if they you are house, house MD. I don't care how good you are. You can't you can't pop a Percocet and then start working on yourself. You need a proper diagnosis and you need proper care. Right? Some of that is soul care. Some of that is is, is mental health, so forth and so on. But folk who are exiting church, listen, um, you need you 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 need some counseling. I promise you, you do. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? Let's see. Thank you, Barbara. Oh, we we really appreciate it. We absolutely appreciate your super chat. Thank you so kindly. Uh, thank you so kindly uh, for your generosity. Uh, let's see. I am scrolling through questions. I, I am. I am scrolling. Um, hang on. Are there any good churches? I keep seeing the same false teachings everywhere. There are good churches and good churches that also everywhere. Um, many of us are working on putting together more of a directory for churches that that meet a certain bar and it's going to take some time, but we are doing that. Now don't fully depend on when we get done, but, but there are good churches, right? And uh, in fact, one of the lives that we did uh, maybe just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about that and somebody asked during the Q and a, what are some of the uh, earmarks? Some of, some of the marks of, you know, a good healthy church, and I went in and talked about that. I can't remember which video it was. Uh, but yeah, every church is not teaching false doctrine. But there are enough churches that are. And the danger in that is, is that not only are the pastors influential, but the teachings are. And they start spreading from person to person. And it's really important because, again, false teaching does have a lasting impact on the way that we think. It is corrosive. Right. It's like a corrosive, you know. Uh, a corrosive is different from a poison in that a corrosive uh, eats away at something like an acid, right? And uh, and and that's exactly so. False doctrine is like a poison and a corrosive. It does both. Uh, let's see. Here's a question: uh, Do you believe? That emotionalism, that emotionalism aids this and is peddled from the pulpit. Yeah, I, you know, and and don't get me wrong, emotionalism. Uh, we ought to involve our emotions in in worship. However, our worship should not be guided by our emotions. It sh it should be part of it. And and when emotionalism gets elevated to such a priority it becomes more seeker uh, centered. What I get out of it, what I feel, what I feel. And some people, oh, I, you know, I, yeah, I visited their church. I, I didn't really feel the Holy Ghost. Like I, 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 I usually feel the Holy Ghost over, over here. And they, they start depending on feeling, right? And, and feeling is just so easily manipulated, right? You, you can't trust how you feel in order to determine what you should believe. And people, oftentimes emotionalism uh, is the, uh, is um, part and parcel, um, one aspect of how people get manipulated. You know, it, it, you know, uh, some cults practice things like love bombing, uh, where they overwhelm you with sh uh, shows of attention and appreciation and gratitude. And just when you're about to leave, pulls you right back in. You know, that is a form of mo emotional uh, manipulation. Ah, uh, how is sowing a financial seed to a pastor uh, will open the windows of, 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 of heaven? 
Um, I, I don't know if I'm I'm understanding the question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question there. But uh, if what you're asking, if if what I think you're asking uh, is um, you're asking essentially about how pastors or how preachers sometimes manipulate um, giving kind of things uh, and with promises that uh, God's going to do this for you, so forth and so on, is that the other. Uh, again, all of that is your type of false doctrine that you want to be aware of any, anyway. Any, anybody promising God's going to do something for you if you do this for me uh, is, is essentially manipulating you. And they're manipulating your ignorance of scripture. Because that stuff won't work on people who are rooted and grounded in the word of God. I'd be like, oh, you really? Is that right? Hmm. Let me show you. You see what I mean? But somebody who thinks that, you know, yeah, you know, they're looking for a blessing and this, that, and the other. Again, remember, part of what causes people to become manipulated is not only their emotions uh, and not only their needs and their desperation, but also their greed. Some people want certain things to be true. They had all these women following Juanita Bynum. They want her to be right. They want what she's saying to be true so that it justifies and validates how they feel. They, they want that to be right. Ah, let's see, what else, what else? BW, wow. If you missed everything, definitely put this on a uh, replay. Usually the teaching uh, will start somewhere around the fourth minute. It'll usually last about 40, 45 minutes, and then we go to Q&A. So you don't have to watch necessarily everything, but the main body of the teaching, definitely you want to catch this. And uh, maybe even time mark it for somebody else to say, hey, watch this video between here and here. It's going to bless you. It's going to really help you, especially when you know people who are involved in, in things like this. But thank you for your super chat, your support of uh, this ministry. We really greatly uh, appreciate it. Ah, uh, Floyd, uh, do you think rejection and replacement of personal creator controlling reality causes persons to cling to cults and false teachings? I'll be honest, I don't I don't even understand this question. I have no idea what you're asking. Rejection and replacement of personal creator. I um you know, it could be me. I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer. So you may have to ask that a different way. Um so that I can get the gist of of what you're you're asking and I will be glad to to answer the question, but I really don't understand. Uh, and I'll say when I don't understand, I, I, I um, uh, and I know sometimes we're just texting and text doesn't come across the same way that we verbalize things. So uh, if you ask it again, uh, as plainly as possible, uh, I'll get back around to uh, answering it again. Uh, let's see. Let's see where we at, where we at. Willie James is a new member. Thank you uh, for becoming a new member here at the Urban Logia channel. We really appreciate uh, your support of this ministry. And uh, that means a lot. Thank you so kindly. Thank you. Uh, ah, somebody said, can you write a book on this topic? That might very well be uh, something that I am uh, interested in doing for sure. Uh, I was a part of a church like that. And I have firsthand experience with it. I definitely understand it. I've seen people live through it. I've seen the different effects of it on other people. A horrific effects uh, till this day, and uh, and so yeah, that may very well be um, a book that I write. Indeed, 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 indeed. Let's see. B. McCray ten. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, wonderful, uh, and uh, thank you for being a support to this ministry. Eddie J. Eddie Jones. Oh wow. I, I'm just humble. I am. I'm greatly humbled and very thankful for all of the supporters. Thank you all. And um, really appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Any other questions here? Okay. Uh, how do family churches end up cultic? 
And how can one exit this situation with the family dynamic still intact? Or is this possible? That's a great question. Um, family dynamics are really tough. Somebody asked a, one of those type questions last night. They're really tough. Here's some of the things that I'm going to, I just, I'm just going to be honest. When you became a Christian, you were signing on to trouble. You really were. Uh, one hurdle after the other. And, and many of those family dynamics will end up becoming uh, what do they say? Uh, a casualty, right? Jesus said this uh, as a result of following him, uh, that um, he has come to put a sword, to place a sword in families, literally division, mother against daughter and father against son, brothers against each other. That doesn't mean Jesus is saying that my mission is to create division. Jesus was saying as a result, of who he is, people are going to be divided. Jesus is the great lightning rod. Folk could be in the same family. Uh, I believe God, and that's all fine until one person identifies God in the person of Jesus. And then the other person's like, well, you know, uh, uh, there's uh, many gods. This said the other. Jesus is the great lightning rod. It's like when you want to be most definitive about where you stand biblically or theologically, you know. And um, families do divide over the truth. They do, and that's one thing that oftentimes now we don't seek to create that division. Like the cults create that division. They teach you how to shun your family and only accept the group as your new family. Cults teach you to do that. Um, the gospel teaches you how to uh, share the good news with your family and be a light and, and a witness to them, right? And, and, and all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, um, there's no guarantee that those dynamics will remain in place. In fact, there's a good chance that you are going to lose some close relationships as a result, right? So. Uh, that's now compounded when you start talking about a church that's just a family church. So almost everybody in there is related. It's going to be hard for the truth to be preached in that church without wounding and bruising egos and fracturing relationships and all kinds of stuff. I don't know if I would ever want to pastor a church where everybody is a cousin or an aunt and an uncle is, I'm, a, you know, as soon as I offend somebody, I've offended them all. That's a tough situation. It is. I, I don't know if I have the answer for that, brother. <laughs> but, but when people are part of, uh, you're talking about family churches, uh, family churches can end up very cultic because of the control mechanisms. Uh, you know, that that the control dynamics that go on. And um, uh, there may be some good articles that are written on that. And, uh, you know, uh, let me know if you run across something like that so I can have the answer the next time somebody asked me a question like that. But it, it, it's uh, family dynamics are really tough to navigate because of the sensitivity of relationships and how people associate what they believe with how they feel uh, relationally or emotionally about it. This is my grandma taught me this. My, you, you gonna tell me that my pastor, the good Reverend Dr. So-and-so, I was under him for 30 years. You gonna tell me he wrong? You know, and, and so people are willing to gamble truth um, on the basis of how they relate to that information, who they love and who they know that believed a different way. And all kinds of other things. So, you know, yeah. Wow. Let's see. Churches in Africa are affected by these teachings too. Are they being negatively influenced by American churches? Uh, sometimes, but African churches have their own dynamics going on, such as African spiritual worldview. And 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 so, what we are actually seeing is the reverse. African spiritual worldview is being imported into America through the Caribbean, 
and Caribbean type churches and African churches that exist here that are also prototype Pentecostal charismatic. So there's a number of dynamics going on, but they have incorporated um, African spiritual worldview into their theology. And as a result, they are influencing us even more so now than we are influencing them. Yeah, so I think it's reversed now. That's a great question. Uh, let's see. Uh, hang on just a second. Um, okay, I just saw a question and I'm not sure where it went. Uh, it does that, these kind of things here. Uh, be patient with me, hang on. Um, there it is, okay. How do you help a friend who is a part of this type of church who now suffers from mental illness uh, and isolation? One of the best things you can tell them, and I'll just repeat this again, is to encourage them to, um, to get counseling. Right, uh, preferably Christian counseling, but definitely professional counseling. Uh, if you can have them watch this video, sometimes people need to be able to recognize certain patterns that that's familiar. Oh, that's familiar. I know what that is. And then they start experiencing, they start realizing that, oh, wow, I know I experienced that. That happens at my church. And sometimes they just need enough shock to realize that there's a problem. Have them watch this video. And then encourage them uh, to to uh, to seek out counseling, help them find it even. But people need to sometimes recognize that a thing is wrong, and a counselor may not necessarily may not necessarily uh, point all of that out, right? But they can help you kind of work through those things. But sometimes you just need to help this person get jump started in terms of recognizing. Um, their experience being articulated in the teaching like this and showing why it's wrong. So uh, start them off with this video. Start them off with this video. A uh, couple more questions and, uh, and, and um, we'll wrap it up. Why do you think so many people that will admit that they see a lot of things wrong in ministry but won't leave uh, cultic churches? Uh, these churches, again, have uh, very strong influences over their judgment and decision-making processes. Uh, so people, they, they, they do see that something is wrong. But what ends up happening is that they have been conditioned to believing that their group. So one of the things that, that churches that regularly teach false doctrine and even cult to do well is they create this thing in 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 they conditioned their uh followers with a us versus them mentality us versus them now us we we're the remnant we are right you know our, our pastor hears from god all this other stuff you're not going to get this kind of good teaching anywhere you, that's why you want to invite people to come to our church, come to our church, you know, and, 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 and after a while, what people start developing is an us versus them, you know, other people, eh, they may not have the truth like we have the truth, right? And once that is established firmly in the mind, even when people start becoming irritated and disgruntled at things going on in the ministry, even to the point that they might end up ultimately leaving, they end up finding it hard to go somewhere else because they are still affected by the poison of the us versus them kind of thinking that created this sense of spiritual elitism and this uh, separatism, sectarian kind of, you know, again, us versus them. And so now they can't find it in themselves to even go anyplace else because in all the time that they were there, they learned how to demonize everybody else and uplift their group as being special. And now that they are no longer part of it because of these various, they're still carrying around a lot of the ideological framework uh, that they learned from that group. So they haven't detoxed from the thinking. They're still victim of the thinking. 
but you see what I mean? And, 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 you know, guilt and anxiety and all fear and all kinds of things keep people from leaving because they, 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 they hear things like the judgment of God will be on you. People who have left this church, then they tell stories. You remember what happened to sister so-and-so when she left, what happened? She lost a job. You know, they, 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 uh, repoed a car and, and, and foreclosed on a house. Then three months later, you know, she, she got a doctor's report that, that she was, you know, uh, uh, dying of cancer. Folks are hearing that. It's like, oh man, she went against the man of God. This kind of stuff goes on and not just in cults in in churches, you know? So, so yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the overemphasis on being anointed? Well, that whole thing is part of what causes uh, certain classes of people to be able to control other groups of people, because you start uh, you start off with this idea, you learn this idea that certain people are anointed. That means that they have uh, that they have a special relationship with God, and and you know special abilities and this that or the other. The reality is is that according to John, the anointing is the Holy Spirit. So we all have. All true believers have the Holy Spirit, right? And uh, now we may have different gifts and different ministries, but none of those things are called the anointing in the New Testament. So, so, so theologically, it's it's already not only uh, a misunderstanding of how the terminology is even used in New Testament theology, but it also leads to this idea of people being more special than others, and that really sets up that control mechanism and dynamic really well in churches that have low view of scripture and high view of human authority, high view of subjective experiences and all of that other stuff at low view of scripture. Wow. If you can't reasonably question your pastor, run. I definitely agree. Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe I missed it, but how does one undo the impact of this stuff that uh, spiritual growth, how they search, you know, uh, impact stuff has on one spiritual growth? So I did a video already talking about discernment. That's one piece. Uh, part of that piece was talking about people uh, having a right doctrinal foundation to begin with. Right. So that's a whole nother piece. But but this. This part that I'm talking about tonight, people need to not only be dis discipled out of this, they need to have the uh, the wrong kind, they need to have that wrong thinking, that framework that they have learned in these groups, these doctrine, they need to have that all deconstructed. They also need counseling to support them emotionally and, 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 and psychologically, so forth and so on. That's what they need, right? There's no one one thing that's going to fix all of it. They, they need a number of things, you know, and, and that's where the church really needs to be multidimensional. I'm not trying to be a cultic when I say dimensional, multifaceted, versatile in, in the ways that it can um, equip, encourage, strengthen, and edify believers. It, you know, we, we've got to be more versatile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To God be the glory. Um, let's see. Um, we'll do. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Thank you so kindly. Uh, we really appreciate it. Let's look at one more question here. Can you give a small synopsis? Uh, can you give a small synopsis of your relationships with? Uh, I'm not sure. Form church members. When you came out of that kind of church, uh, then and now, um, I'm not even sure what you're asking there. Uh, with uh, with former church members, when you came out, okay, I think I, I get what you're saying. Uh, yeah, let me just say this real quick because you know, I, again, uh, I can only give a synopsis here. Um, you know, some church members are just going to cut you off. 
because you have done the unthinkable. You have betrayed, you have done all of that. That stuff has an effect on your mind. You ever, you ever, um, sometimes you're watching a police show where a person goes deep undercover and this, that, or the other, and they have earned the trust of people in this group that they have infiltrated, so forth and so on. They, they're acting this character out. And as a result, they're using real actual emotions and they start actually developing care and concern for these people that they're really there to bust. And, and then what ends up happening, and this happens in, in real life, uh, if they're successful, the person gets busted, but then they have to go through counseling because the impact of having betrayed somebody that they earned their trust takes a toll on them. And even though they know in the end it was for a good cause, they literally lied. They earned the trust of this person and they saw the look of disappointment in that person's eye who now was like, wow, I thought you were who you said you were. That has an impact on them. What ends up happening to those detectives? Well, they take time off for counseling so that they can learn to emotionally process the feelings and of the guilt associated with betraying somebody. That's exactly what ends up happening when um, that's what causes some people to stay even longer. They don't want to feel rejection. But, you know, hey, listen, I went through it. Uh, certain church members, they, they don't talk to you anymore. You're no longer a brother and this, that, and the other. And, um, yeah, you go through that. But that's why you need a supporting faith community. You cannot walk through these things by yourself. You just cannot do it. You've got to belong to uh, a healthy Bible, people that can walk with you through it. You know, I got to run, y'all. I, I, I really pray. I really do pray that this was uh, incredibly helpful. Uh, there you go. In too deep. There you go. I, I literally was. That's what I had in my mind. I was literally describing that. Uh, and, and that's just a that's just a picture of what actually really does happen. And uh, I have a video on that, uh, Terrence. I actually have a video about cults and cult uh, cultism that kind of differentiates between what's cultic and what's actually a cult. And I definitely want to encourage you uh, to check that out. I deal with some of the things that I talk about in this video, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm dealing with what it is more so in, in that video by, by definition, really breaking that down. And uh, definitely check out the Urban Logia Library. Uh, that was a recent video. So that one might be maybe two or three months old, uh, but it's definitely in there. And uh, absolutely, absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Thank you all uh, tonight for making this uh, what it is. All of you uh, supporters, all of uh, shout out, special shout out to all of the new members. Uh, all of you who have newly subscribed, all of the super chatters uh, supporting the ministry, and all of you who have just participated in the comment section, asking questions and uh, making comments and uh, uh, doing all of that. Yes, I actually do have one that deals with, no, 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 I'm sorry. I don't have one that deals with free will. I do have one that deals with, uh, so well, yeah. One that deals with sovereignty, and I touch on, um, I do touch on free will. Uh, it's in the library as well. There's one on the sovereignty of God, um, and in that, I, I definitely deal with free will. But the entire teaching is mostly on the sovereignty of God, not necessarily free will. But that comes into um, question in the uh, in the teaching. Uh, so uh, again. Uh, somebody said, I didn't answer black atheist. Um, hold on. There is the, uh, video on cults and, uh, cultic churches. And, uh, let's see. Thank you, Penny. I don't know where black atheists, uh, question is. Um, I'm not sure where his question is. I I I I I didn't see it. Is this the question? Uh is, is this the question, uh, Wayne, that uh black atheist was asking? 
if sincere people get misled from the truth, isn't that a problem if God wants uh, people to follow him? Maybe if that's the question, um, you know, okay, yeah. So somebody's already uh, essentially uh, answering that question. I guess there was some conversation going on, uh, but I will say this. Yes, God wants people to surrender to him and to follow him so forth and so on, right? Um, that's also true, but it is also true that uh, a person's sin nature has incapacitated their uh, ability and their willingness to follow him. Uh, and that is where uh, the doctrine of election and, and uh, predestination is really important. Uh, if uh, people don't just hear the gospel and respond to it because they're willing to, no man seeks after the Lord. No man searches after God. So, so it is really the work of God in the person's life that draws the person to hearing the gospel, receiving the gospel, and placing faith in in the Son. Right? It, that that cannot be done on the merit or the initiation of that person's will without God. Right. So that, that's how that works. Right. But being misled from the truth has serious consequences for everybody, even if a person is a Christian. It has serious consequences. And, and again, tonight we talked about the psychological effects of it. So, uh, uh, no, that's not theistic determinism. That, that's not. That's a totally different thing. Uh, you know, it's not determinism. Uh, but uh, that's a whole different piece there. You know, again, there are other teachings on that. Uh, I, that's why I try to answer questions that are most relative to what we're talking about here. So I don't get carried off in the, um, having to deal with wider theological issues, mostly that I've already covered in, in other teachings. Uh, but I do have that. Uh, I do have that question answered in a teaching on election. That's also in the library as well. Uh, the last one, does God have the ability to stop false churches? And if so, why doesn't God stop them? He definitely has the ability to do it. Uh, one reason why God doesn't is because false churches are a judgment on people who have rejected the truth. So remember in Romans 1, what God does to people who know the truth, but they reject it and they resist it. Uh, one of the things that Paul says God does is he turns them over to the things that they lust for so that they become reprobate. And uh, that is what you would call God's passive judgment. And so in, in some senses, false churches are a judgment against people who have already rejected the truth. And so God turns them over to the lies that they're already willing to believe. Yeah. All right, y'all, I got to get out of here. Thank you so much for uh, your participation, your support, your prayers, and all of that good stuff. Uh, pray for me. We'll be back on tomorrow, Lord willing, and uh, tonight. But Definitely share this video. Stop at uh, stop over at urbanlogia.org. Uh, get you a t-shirt. Uh, pick up a course. Uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Blessings to all of you is my prayer.